J'ai le grand plaisir de vous présenter le professeur Giuseppe Longobardi, euh, anniversary professor à l'Université de York. Euh, Giuseppe ou Pino Longobardi euh, a étudié à l'École normale supérieure de Pise, euh, à l'Université de Pise, aussi hein, à Paris, comme boursier d'échange avec l'École normale de la rue Dume. On a tous eu cette expérience importante. Il a été professeur de linguistique à Venise, à Trieste, et maintenant, dans les derniers dix ans, à York. C'est un grand syntacticien, un spécialiste de syntaxe comparative. Il a donné beaucoup de contributions marquantes, en particulier dans la dernière je dirais, quinzaine d'années, ou peut-être un peu plus, il propose un modèle très original de comparaison linguistique, aussi pour l'étude de la diachronie profonde de langue, qui n'est pas basée sur les ressemblances lexicales, comme la méthode classique, mais sur les propriétés de variation syntaxique, sur les paramètres. Je n'ai pas eu le temps d'introduire cette notion, donc il devra le faire lui-même dans sa présentation. Donc, merci beaucoup, Pino, et bienvenue à Paris. Merci. Bonjour à tous. Je vais donner ma, ma conférence en anglais, mais ensuite, vous pouvez poser toutes tout questions en français, et je, je peux vous répondre en, en français, d'accord je, je donne la conférence en anglais pour des raisons, disons, euh, de, soit de, de, de captation et soit de, de, de terminologie technique de la phylogénétique linguistique. OK, so, um, I will try to start from a general problem which goes much beyond the normal scope of linguistics, of the study of language. And this is the problem of whether it is possible to do history as a, as a science. Uh, this is a problem which has been particularly carefully uh, addressed at the end of a famous book uh, by, by Jared Diamond, the ornithologist and anthropologist at the same time <laughs> uh, at the University of California uh, at Los Angeles. His famous book is called um, uh, which, uh, uh, what's the English word? Uh, um, I think it's uh, 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 arms, steel, and, and ger germs, germs, steel, guns, and steel. Yeah, guns, germs, and steel. Okay, no, I, I never remember the order of the words in the English in the English version. Okay, and the, in the epilogue of his famous book, um, he raises this problem and uh, tries to uh, state some conditions uh, which make uh, history, which could make history possible as a scientific discipline. Uh, of course, as any science, uh, uh, history uh, should try to identify some network of regularities. And as linguists, we, we can say that uh, the more abstract uh, in general Uh, these regularities are uh, the better uh, to approach the domain in a historical uh, fashion, in a scientific and historical fashion. Then, of course, uh, the domain in question must have a sufficient degree of variability across time and space, because otherwise you, you, you cannot talk about history, of course. And then, Uh, as for every science, uh, at least since the scientific revolution of the 17th century, uh, in, order, in order to have a really scientific approach, it is necessary for the domain to be subject in principle to some kind of quantitative modeling. And finally, and this is the main point in, uh, in Diamond's, uh, in Diamond's uh, uh, statement of the problem, it is necessary to be able to study a domain for a long period of time. Okay? And uh, this strategy is, is very important in order to, avo to avoid accidental factors 
in, uh, in the development of history, which may somehow uh, obscure the general long time regularities. And actually, the, 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 the subtitle of his book is uh, uh, A History of the Last 10,000 Years. Okay? And that's the, the time dimension, the time size that he tends to consider, which uh, a time size, which uh, time depth, which goes even beyond uh, the one of other classical approaches to long time history, for instance, in Brodel's notion of uh, histoire de longue durée. Okay? So this is why I took uh, diamond, diamond viewpoint uh, as, as my point of departure. And I will try to uh, discuss how linguistics and cognitive science, so a modern approach to linguistics, may contribute to this kind of enterprise. Um, OK. OK, fine. So um, let's, let's take one point uh, in, into consideration. Uh, over the past 20 years, there has been 20, 25 years, there has been uh, a big revolution in historical linguistics and especially in phylogenetic linguistics, in, in, in the kind of linguistics which tries to reconstruct the genealogical trees of, of languages and reconstruct the ancestors of, of present present day languages. And this quantitative revolution um, has, been, has been very important in reshaping the methods of the field. But uh, the input data which are being used uh, throughout the various approaches of, of this, this uh, general quantitative framework uh, have not really changed. And uh, they are largely uh, the same as were provided by classical historical linguistics, and most of them were essentially ready in type and even in token at the end of the 19th century. And this, I mean, this type of input data is essentially lexical etymologies. So relationships uh, among, among words, words with similar meanings across different languages, and some kind of similar form. Now, um, this kind of work, which uh, I mean, looking for the etymologies of words in trying to reconstruct their ancestors and trying to reconstruct the, um, the relationships uh, of languages by comparing the words, uh, has been very important in the 19th century. And the method which was developed at the time was already somehow scientific in the sense of satisfying the first point of the, the, the first condition for scientific history, namely the identification of abstract regularities. For instance, one point which is very important is that uh, Two words in two different languages may be very similar in form and meaning, but this does not mean anything in terms of their etymology unless you find a systematic relationship between sounds uh, in, in their distribution within, within the words. For instance, a, a very good example is the one of Spanish mucho, which means much, of course, and English much, which uh, especially in the part of England where I work, uh, is pronounced much, actually. So much and mucho are very similar, okay? And actually, even the so-called uh, uh, règle du trois uh, that Antoine Meillet, the famous French comparative, comparativist, uh, uh, suggested, namely that uh, a reasonable Indo-European etymology uh, had to be based on three instances of a certain, of a certain word in three different languages uh, is falsified in this case because, uh, for instance, in other parts of, of Italy where I, uh, where I worked in the past, uh, much is often, or is often said uh, un mucho de, which means a lot of. So one could simply take this un mucho de of northern, northeast, northeastern Italian, much of Spanish, much of northern, 
Northern England and decide that you have three words which are almost identical in form and identical in meaning, but this means nothing in terms of etymology because the, the three words have completely different etymologies. Okay, so uh, instead, instead what the classical historical linguists uh, have shown is that something much more abstract th than that is what really counts in defining the relatedness of uh, words across different languages and as a consequence, the relatedness of these languages. So for instance, just as a simple, simple example, there are many, many words, for instance, in, in French where you find the dip, diphthong wa, written o, o, i, and uh, these words correspond to a closed e in Italian, okay, from some long e in Latin, and this is, this is true in words like uh, roi, toile, voile, and uh, there are many others that, that one could cite. And it is this particular relationship between, between two sounds which are not even very similar from the physical viewpoint, but have uh, the same distribution across many words in the vocabularies of, of two languages, which really proves uh, the relatedness of, of two or more languages. Okay, so the point is that the quantitative revolution which uh, has taken place uh, over the past 20, 25 years in historical linguistics has not radically changed uh, this kind of approach and the kind of data uh, which support uh, its conclusions. So what's the problem with that? Well, of course, I've just said, I mean, that's, that's certainly a scientific approach. Uh, there, are, there is a lot to, to recommend to it, but it has a sort of intrinsic limit, intrinsic problem. Namely, this kind of regular sound correspondences across languages uh, tends to, uh, uh, to become blurred. Uh, to, be, to become irretrievable after a certain number of years, actually, actually a certain number of millennia. Of course, it's not completely clear what is, what is the, 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 the bottom limit of this method. As some, some, some linguists say maybe 6,000 years, others say uh, eight, 9,000 years, but certainly we cannot go terribly deep uh, into history by this traditional method. So, uh, okay, uh, why is this a problem? Well, first of all, it's a problem because uh, we want to somehow to accept uh, Jared Diamond's challenge, namely that we should uh, pursue history for, say, 10,000 years, maybe even more. And this is one reason, and a conceptual one, but there is also another empirical reason. So if linguists, uh, in uh, the theoretical sense, are now challenged by ChatGPT. Uh, historical linguists are challenged by something else, which is somehow even more dangerous, or at least uh, uh, more deeply established as a, as a scientific approach now, and that's population genetics and molecular anthropology. Namely, the fact that uh, the, um, the discoveries about genetic markers, and lately, uh, molecular molecular markers, nam namely the direct study of the DNA of individuals and, and, and populations, uh, has allowed uh, geneticists to make uh, very deep hypotheses about the origin and movements of human populations. So from, for instance, if you, if you look at this, this map from the genographic project, uh, you can, you can see that hypotheses about uh, uh, the, different, the, the, the biological split uh, of human populations um, have been proposed uh, up to 50,000 years ago, up to, the, up to the time when, according to some uh, molecular, molecular biologists, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, split uh, between Africans and non-Africans uh, took place uh, with the first humans peopling people uh, Australia. And 
even even some 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 deeper splits uh, have been postulated within Africa, which is which is the continent where most of the biological and probably also the linguistic uh, diversification of humans uh, has taken place. Okay, so this is a big challenge for us because linguists uh, may go back, say, 6,000 years or 7,000 years, and geneticists claim they can go back uh, some 50,000 years, maybe even more. Uh, the, the important difference here is that linguists may compare, may usefully compare languages from uh, what we call families, and families uh, are recognized with this particular uh, time limit, while geneticists, in principle, may compare the DNA uh, of uh, every pair of human beings. Uh, I'm saying this is true in principle, because in practice, the actual data which are available uh, are not the same for all individuals, of, uh, and, and especially for all populations. So the situation is a little bit like, uh, I don't know, if linguists uh, had uh, uh, the complete vocabulary of certain languages, the complete morphology of some other languages, the syntax of a third type of languages, and it is not really possible to have a global comparison uh, which is really rich in data. But the progress in the study of the DNA is such that in a short time, uh, geneticists will have a, a, a lot of data comparable across all uh, human populations. Okay, um, so this is a challenge, but okay, this is also a sort of uh, source of inspiration for, uh, for us linguists. Uh, this work in population genetics, which has largely been started by work by Luca Cavalli Sforza some 70, 75 years ago, uh, represents an important model for what we could do. Uh, because he took what we can call a shortcut, a short way from, uh, from science to history. Uh, in order to satisfy the conditions, the general conditions which I suggested before, uh, the best way would be taking something which is already a science and trying to use it to draw consequences about history. And this is exactly the, the big intuition by Cavalli Sforza some 75 years ago. Uh, essentially, the, the, the then modern biology, namely the discovery of genetic markers, even of pre-DNA genetic markers, was transferred into the study of the history of human populations. Populations. Uh, this was something which uh, had not been really conceived before, before his work. And now we can think of something which could be analogous. Namely, uh, over the past uh, 50 years, the study of formal linguistics, the, the study of what we call the, uh, the generative bio biolinguistics, uh, the gener generative biolinguistic model, uh, as part of the revolution in the cognitive sciences has provided uh, detailed models not only of uh, universal principles of language, such as the ones uh, Luigi has, has exposed uh, for, the past, uh, for the past hour and a half, but also of uh, the particular fashion in which different languages may differ in their, in their syntax, in their grammatical structure. Okay, so uh, over the past, uh, I would say, 40 years, we've gone much beyond the idea that language differences are just uh, differences in words. Uh, and now we have a, a model of how grammars, in particular, in particular the syntax of different languages, may, uh, may vary. And one popular approach, um, which stemmed out of uh, Chomsky's research program in, in generative grammars, uh, is that uh, syntactic diversity can be largely reduced to points of binary variation. 
So two languages may differ because one language has, say, plus and another language has minus, or zero or one in a certain particular point, and the uh, point of, of its, well, let's say, of their syntactic rules. Uh, and uh, this binary difference may produce a lot of uh, apparently complex uh, uh, surface manifestations of uh, language diversity. Okay. Now, just to give you an idea, um, we must consider that these points of binary differentiation, which are technically called parameters in linguistics, but for instance, a geneticist would call them uh, syntactic polymorphisms or dimorphisms. So points where languages may uh, have one form or another form in just one, one, one of these two. So these so-called parameters seem to recur language after language in few general types of formats. Okay? So just to give you some, some of the most recurrent uh, formats, uh, for instance, we, uh, we can have languages which use grammatical features like person. So all Indo-European languages distinguish first person, second person, third person formally, and this has syntactic consequences. But for instance, Japanese and Korean don't, okay? Or number, okay? Uh, we Indo-Europeans uh, use, use number in all sorts of, of ways, of obligatory ways, so ways that we can call grammaticalized in our languages, but for instance in Chinese, there's no trace of this kind of phenomenon, and so on. And please consider one, one fact that uh, these languages are uh, as uh, efficient in communication and everyday usage as in the European languages. Okay? So there's no, there's no difference in the functional effect of these abstract grammatical differences. Uh, another, another type uh, of, of difference which is, which is quite recurrent uh, across languages is uh, uh, if uh, languages uh, uh, spell out certain categories, especially pronouns in their phonology, or may just uh, uh, use invisible, unpronounced uh, mm, elements to express the meaning of pronouns. Okay, this is, this is a, a classical uh, a classical subject which has been uh, studied uh, in, the, in the 70s, in the, in the 80s, uh, especially by, by people like Tarleton, by Luigi himself. Uh, and it's, it, it's well known that languages like uh, French and English use more subject pronouns than languages like Italian and Spanish. Okay? And this kind, uh, this kind of, of difference is found in other language families as well. Okay, and then another type of uh, differenti differentiation, which is a variation which is found uh, across languages, is that in certain languages, uh, certain elements are displaced phonologically, are pronounced in positions which are different. Uh, from the position where they are pronounced in other languages, but the actual logical interpretation remains the same. Okay? And this is very typical of question words, of the position of, of, of nouns, of the position of verbs. So in all of these cases, you can reduce the difference between pairs of languages to uh, binary, to simple binary points like having or not having a certain property, say displacement, uh, phonological representation, grammaticalization of a, of a certain particular feature. Okay, so uh, some 20 years ago, uh, I started to play around with the, uh, with the idea that maybe what Cavalli Sforza uh, had been doing in, uh, uh, in population genetics by using the universal comparability of genetic markers could be done in uh, theoretical grammar by relying on the universal comparability of uh, syntactic parameters, 
okay, of, the, of these binary points. So that languages could be, the syntax of languages could be somehow uh, reduced uh, uh, to strings of binary values, and these strings could be collated and compared. And this kind of approach uh, uh, was called by myself and by my main collaborator in this uh, enterprise, uh, Professor Cristina Guardiano from the University of Reggio Emilia, uh, the parametric comparison method. Okay. And so we started in the first decade of this century trying to show that this was technically possible, formally possible, and that this was potentially informative. So that the syntax of languages could be used to try to retrieve some kind of historical signal and basically to draw uh, genealogical trees of languages without uh, looking at the vocabulary, so at the, at the lexical etymologies. Okay, uh, this, kind of, um, this kind of approach uh, looks, uh, well, relatively plausible and natural from the viewpoint of what I've just exposed, but it goes against, it runs against uh, a long tradition of skepticism in linguistics about uh, the possibility that the syntax of languages uh, may contain a uh, historical signal. And uh, this, kind, uh, this, this kind of skepticism um, began with the very beginning of comparative linguistics at the end of the 18th century, but it is remarkable how the same kind of skepticism, basically expressed in very similar words, uh, has been repeated repeated until the beginning of this century. So if you take, uh, if you take uh, uh, this statement by Anderson and, uh, and uh, Lightfoot, uh, they say that the English grammars might be more similar to grammars with which there is less historical connection. So the idea is that, well, maybe uh, English is, is more similar to French than, than to German, and French is more similar to English than, than Italian. This is what they, what they say. And they say there is no reason to believe that structural similarity should be even an approximate function of historical relatedness. Okay, so the basic idea is that uh, the binary values of parameters uh, are subject to chance distribution across time and space and do not, um, do not provide information about the history of languages. This is the, somehow the official position of linguistics. And, and uh, as I said, um, you can find uh, all sorts of quotes uh, over the past 200 years uh, claiming exactly this point, which is, has been repeated uh, by historical linguists, by structural linguists, uh, and, and even by generative linguists like, like Anderson and Lightfoot. Okay. But okay, what we want to show is that uh, making this claim uh, can be correct, actually is correct, if you take just one single parameter at a time. Okay? But this is no different from taking mucho and much and concluding that uh, they do not prove anything about the relationship between Spanish and English. So this may be true uh, on certain occasions, but the general pattern, so the, the, the systematicity of the comparison, may falsify the idea that syntax does not contain a historical signal, exactly like applying a regular method based on systematic uh, sound, uh, sound correspondences uh, can easily falsify the idea that, uh, uh, the false idea, the, the obvious, obviously false idea that uh, English and Spanish are not related because much and much are accidentally similar and, and, and uh, do not have a common etymology. Okay, so uh, let's see what we can do um, 
to, to achieve this, uh, this, this goal. Basically, uh, what we should do in order to have a general systematic uh, picture is trying to combine some tools of the recent quantitative revolution in historical linguistics, in phylogenetics, with a radical shift, shift in the quality of the taxonomic characters which are used. Okay, so this is the, this is the basic idea. Uh, so, uh, I will just give you uh, a, few, uh, a few pieces of information about uh, the notion of parameter that we were using. Uh, there's an article which was published uh, uh, three years ago in an Italian journal, but it's in English, and uh, uh, provides, uh, provides a sort of introduction to the concept of parametric variation that we are adopting here. And what is most important in the uh, online uh, supplementary material, uh, we provide a list and a short description of 94 parameters, so 94 uh, syntactic dimorphisms, um, which which have to do with the structure of noun phrases, and which have been um, and whose values have been set set in about sixty different languages. Uh, so the idea is that every parameter has a, a sort of marked and unmarked value, and the marked value is the one which must be set from. Uh, primary data in the course of language acquisition. Um, and its, uh, it's uh, uh, conventional representation will be with a plus. Uh, so in principle, languages should be from the, viewpoint, uh, from the viewpoint of the language learner will be strings of pluses. From the viewpoint of the, of, of the linguist who has to compare one language to another language, there will be strings of pluses and minuses. Okay? Uh, but actually, uh, there's a third symbol which is, uh, which is important in, uh, in this case, uh, especially for comparison, and it's a symbol that we call zero. Uh, that basically means that uh, certain properties in certain languages are completely predictable from the setting of the values of uh, other parameters. Okay, so this adds to the complexity of the deductive structure of the system, uh, but the, concept, the concepts are quite similar. So languages from the viewpoint of the comparative, of the historical comparative linguist, uh, at least, uh, are strings, are, the syntax of languages are strings of plus, minuses, and zeros. Okay, and in order to compare them, we must uh, look uh, if at a certain point, so a certain locus of this kind of DNA of, uh, of languages, you have an identity, so plus plus, or minus minus, uh, or a difference, plus minus minus plus, and if you have a zero in one of the two languages, this is sufficient to discard that point as a point of comparison. Okay, that's the, this is the basic idea. Notice that there are many zeros in the sense that the deductive structure of modern, of modern syntactic theory is, is very important so that, for instance, in this set of, uh, of about 60 languages and 94 parameters, we find uh, over 45% uh, of the values which are zeros. Uh, this is very important because this really states uh, the, the difference between a surface approach, which just looks at the surface manifestations of parameters, and uh, a theoretically informed approach, which only compares uh, uh, real points of cognitive difference between the syntax of two languages. Okay? Uh, now, 45% of uh, irrelevant information may, uh, may have an important effect, um, uh, may, may be a, a real burden on uh, a comparative approach which is only based on surface typology. Okay, now as a first approach, we should try to measure difference differences among languages. And in order to do so, we must choose between a huge number of possible distances. Okay? We've worked a lot with, uh, with the colleagues in mathematics, uh, at the mathematics department at the University of Trieste for many years. And in the end, uh, we concluded, uh, and also they concluded in separate articles, that uh, uh, 
several different kinds of distances provide basically the same historical effect, okay? Which means that there is a certain robustness which is intrinsic to the data, uh, and that probably the simplest approach to, to measure distances uh, among strings of, of, of syntactic of parametric values is what is called the Jacquard distance. Okay? This guy Jacquard was, was a botanist who at the beginning of the 20th century measured and classified uh, the difference between uh, various types of flora in the, in the Jura. Okay? Uh, and his distance is called the Jacquard distance. It's a distance which makes an, an idealization which is possibly relevant in our case. Namely, uh, it takes uh, uh, only identities based on plus plus, so on positive uh, marked values as relevant in order to calculate the distance between, between two languages. This gives a slightly better result than uh, including also uh, identities based on minus minus, so on default values. Um, which is somehow a positive and slightly expected result, uh, given the fact that uh, there is this asymmetry between marked and unmarked values in the, uh, presumably in the ontogenetics of languages, but then we can conclude also uh, in the diachron, in the, in the phylogenetics of, of languages. Okay, uh, so this is more or less the distribution of the languages we've considered. That there is one which is missing uh, from the map, and that's um, Malagasy, simply because it's, it's too so southern in, uh, in geographical distribution. Uh, and the colors roughly represent uh, uh, language families. Okay, uh, the language families traditionally recognized on the basis of uh, uh, the classical comparative method, um, on the basis of lexia etymologies, uh, uh, are 15 in this domain. So across Eurasia, uh, Malagasy can be can be considered a Eurasian language because it's it's a, it's an Austronesian language. So all Austronesian languages uh, originate from from Taiwan or originally. Okay, and then uh, what, we, what we did was uh, feeding the set of distances among these languages uh, to uh, some, some algorithm which generates, uh, which generates trees, uh, and, and we got a tree which uh, puts together, uh, puts together um, all these languages from 15 different families. Okay, this is one of the most rec recent results. Now, what is important here uh, with respect to classical methods? With classical methods, uh, um, so all, all distances here are between zero and one, where zero means complete identity and one means complete, com complete difference, of course. Now, if we try to use distances uh, retrieved from lexical comparison, uh, languages which do not belong uh, to the same family would have a distance one by definition. So no common etymology, so complete difference. Instead, by the syntactic method, we can significantly compare languages which uh, belong into different uh, lexical, et lexical etymological families. Now, uh, then what we did was trying to, um, to test Anderson and Lightfoot's uh, uh, statement of skepticism about uh, syntax as a, as a signal of historical relatedness. And uh, in order to, to do that, we just took the list of all the families and subfamilies which are recognized by classical uh, lexical, lexical methods, by classical comparative methods, uh, and we tried to see how many of them were captured by the syntactic tree. And the result is that 88%, and we, we, we call this, uh, this reference uh, uh, set of, uh, of uh, families and subfamilies the gold standard, okay? which has no economic uh, value in this case. I mean, it's just, uh, <laughs> just a convention. And uh, so we captured 88% of the gold standard uh, through the syntactic, the syntactic tree. And the interesting point is that the 12% which we did not capture, it's basically 
located in just in two areas, uh, it's clearly connect connected to uh, areas where we know independently that important secondary aerial contact and convergence has taken place on other, ling on on other linguistic levels. So these two areas are basically the, the area, uh, the Balkans, where uh, Bulgarian is recognized uh, by its syntactic structure as part of the Slavic family, but as an outlier of the other languages of the family and not as part of the South Slavic uh, uh, subfamily. Okay, but we know that Bulgarian is, is in, in the middle of, of, of an area of intense secondary contact, name, namely the, the, the Balkan linguistic area, and we are actually able to identify which syntactic parameters of Bul Bulgarian are different from the other Slavic languages, and they ha happen to have the same value as Romanian and Greek, so the two languages which are uh, contiguous to Bulgarian. And the other point, which is uh, uh, um, basically recurrent in all our uh, experiments, is the position of English, which seems to be uh, slightly more similar to North Germanic, to Scandinavian, than to continental West Germanic than we might expect. But probably some, some of you know that, especially over the past uh, uh, 10 years, there has been a very, very strong um, debate uh, um, about the, the actual classification of English as a West Germanic or North Germanic language uh, after a, a famous book by uh, Joseph Emmons, uh, Jan, Jan Terje Forlund, uh, who claimed that actually Middle English and as a consequence uh, Modern English are a more direct uh, offspring of, uh, uh, of Old Norse, uh, as brought by the Vikings into the, the, the British Isles, than of Old English. Okay, this is, this is a position which has been rebutted by many, many scholars, but uh, at least uh, a strong debate on this point uh, is, uh, is going on. So we're not particularly surprised by this syntactic result. Uh, so, um, now, what did historical, traditional historical linguists do uh, once they discovered that, say, certain languages are more similar to others than uh, they are to languages which are distant, uh, which belong to other families? So when they, say, discovered the, the unity of Indo-European languages. Well, of course, the first thing they did was uh, trying to informally, at the time, informally measure the degree of similarity. And this way, they were able to claim that uh, certain languages are Indo-European because they are clearly very similar to each other. And that uh, among these languages, some were Iranian, some were, say, Indo-Aryan, some were Romance, Germanic, and so on. But then, after that, after, say, some 20, 30 years, they began studying their similarities and differences in some detail, okay? And this way, they uh, began uh, reconstructing sound cha changes, particular sound changes in the history of languages. And they essentially uh, uh, proved the, uh, or double proved somehow, uh, these hypotheses by showing that within certain families you can uh, reconstruct changes step by step, okay? So in principle, after uh, building up uh, trees uh, uh, on the basis of uh, syntactic distances, uh, one would like uh, to apply more sophisticated algorithms which just take uh, strings of characters and um, construct genealogical trees in terms of step-by-step -step reconstruction of the syntactic changes and of reconstruction of the various ancestral stages, okay? So, there are algorithms which uh, 
do that or try to do that, uh, but they are not particularly fit to the particular to, to the conditions, to the specific conditions of uh, syntactic history uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, so, first of all, uh, they can, cannot be uh, very reliably used uh, in order to compare languages from uh, potentially different families. So they are not considered as heuristics for, for families for one reason, namely that all of these character-based algorithms are algorithms which one way or the other try to minimize the number of changes from the root of the tree, from the ancestor to the various daughters. Uh, to the various daughter languages. But of course, if you're not sure that there is actually an ancestor, then all, all these calculations become very unreliable. This is one point. The second point is that we have zeros, and we have a lot of zeros. And uh, these algorithms do not know exactly how to treat zeros. This is a problem which can only be in part remedied. And in order to do that, uh, we actually coded zeros uh, in, uh, as, as missing in information. Uh, of course, this means that uh, uh, the, the algorithm will not reconstruct any zero. And at various stages, at, at least at the, at the root stage of the tree, uh, you probably want to uh, reinsert zeros wherever they are predicted by the implications of linguistic theory. This can be done in a semi-automatic way. Uh, so it's a problem which is not solved. It can be partly controlled. Uh, and then the third problem is that uh, these algorithms should be informed about something which begins to be obvious to linguists, namely the fact that uh, in, uh, um, in, the, in, in syntactic history, some parametric changes are very plausible and others are very plausible or, or completely unattested. So, for instance, in, in Eurasia, we know of many languages which have picked up definiteness, so developing a definite article and other devices of this type, but at least within Eurasia, we know of no case of the other type. Okay? So this is, this is a kind of information that a character-based algorithm should be, able, should be able to know, and so far we've been unable, I mean, to inform, to inform these uh, uh, these algorithms about, um, uh, about this particular point. This notwithstanding, uh, we generated trees for at least the two families for which we are sure, independently sure, that there is a common ancestor, namely Indo-European and, uh, and uh, Finno-Ugric. Okay? And, okay, Okay, I can show Finno-Ugric, at least the, fee, the few Finno-Ugric languages that we have here. Uh, and what we obtained is uh, trees uh, which are very similar to the ones which have been uh, uh, produced by, um, uh, by UPGMA, so by, by a distance-based uh, based program. Uh, actually, um, we obtain, uh, we obtain a number of gold standard nodes captured by the, by the BEAST, B, B, okay, BEAST, BEAST is a character-based uh, based program. Uh, um, the, the, the number of, uh, the, the percentage of uh, gold standard nodes captured uh, is uh, almost 88%, almost 87.5%, so essentially the same as we, as we, as we got uh, uh, from UPGMA, and uh, the 12% the uh, is again related to the particular position of Bulgarian and, and of English. So th the result is robust to different types of algorithms, e even from this viewpoint. Okay, uh, I, will, uh, I will come to this, this conclusion now, uh, what we call the homology conjecture. Uh, namely, the idea is that uh, 
And, and, and this is the real falsification of Anderson and Lightfoot's position. Namely, the empirical result, results seem to show that syntactic and lexical histories uh, will provide the same evolutionary topologies once interference, so secondary convergence, is equally taken into account. Namely, the only cases where lexical history and syntactic history differ uh, are cases where we know that uh, some kind of uh, borrowing, borrowing uh, interference or secondary convergence has taken place. Now, the fact that you don't see that in the, in the classical trees is because uh, all data which are similar as the product of borrowing have been removed from the input data to any kind of uh, uh, lexical classification. Okay, no, no, one, no one would say that uh, Spanish, uh, and, uh, Spanish, French, and Italian are related because uh, all of these languages uh, use the word abajour, okay? Uh, because it's clear that it's a French word which has been borrowed into Spanish and Italian. So that would be, that would be eliminated, and historical linguists are, um, uh, are even more sophisticated than that. For instance, they would uh, eliminate the, the Italian word cavaliere, uh, saying that at least part of it uh, is, is, is a French borrowing, okay? Because, because Italian should have uh, something like cavallaio or, cava or cavallaro, okay? So there are sophisticated techniques uh, to avoid any kind of, of effect of secondary, secondary convergence and, and borrowing uh, on the lexicon. We do not have such techniques yet in syntax, so we expect exactly this minor divergence, this, this 12%. Okay, so um, now the second point that we want to, that we want to discuss, uh, the, the final point I would say, is uh, uh, whether we can use syntax to go deeper than uh, other classical systems. Okay, and uh, so we, we, we wrote an article uh, a couple of years ago um, in collaboration with some mathematicians uh, which essentially tried to, um, to assess the uh, statistical robustness of uh, the nodes, the ancient nodes, uh, uh, suggested by uh, a UPGMA3, uh, the ones which go beyond the time depth uh, of classical methods, so beyond the gold standard. Okay, and this is, this is a non-trivial way, so you must invent something to do that. Uh, so what we did, well, I, I try to be brief on this, uh, the, basic idea, the basic idea was this. Um, let's take uh, the, um, the constraints um, on, on, on the syntactic parameters, the, the, let's take the 94 syntactic parameters we've been working with, with all the implication or constraints uh, provided by linguistic theory, suggested by linguistic theory. Uh, let's take uh, some kind, let's do some kind of, of statistics about uh, the distribution of the value, so the the, the frequency of the values of the various parameters across the different families that we know of. And on the basis of this, let's generate a huge number of uh, possible languages, okay? Uh, and of course, uh, these possible languages may be compared to each other, so we can generate distances from these possible languages and we can consider the distribution of these distances. Uh, and then, of course, we can decide that we have some significant thresholds, and we can try to see if some real distances are shorter than the distances that we would obtain by generating, by accidentally, by randomly uh, gen generating a, a number of artificial languages and artificial distances, okay. So, um, so these are the two curves of real languages and artificial languages. Of course, they have been uh, normalized in, in, uh, in size because we have uh, uh, over 12 million uh, artificial distances and 1,653 real distances. But what is, what is interesting here is that, uh, okay, 
what you see is this part here, I mean, the, the one shaded in, in pale blue, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which contains uh, the real linguistic distances, language distances, which we find and which uh, were not generated by the uh, uh, random genera gen generation mechanisms. So the kind of real world distances which are shorter than the expectation. Okay, this is the basic point. Okay, um, now um, in order to simplify the general picture, uh, I will show here distances not among languages but among among families. The average distances among among families. Now consider that uh, uh, if you take uh, if you take a threshold of 5% distribution uh, of artificial languages. So the 5% shortest artificial language distances uh, uh, are below a threshold of 0 0.3. And the 5% highest uh, artificial distances are above a threshold of 0 0.7, okay? Uh, now, you can see that uh, the yellow distances are around 0 0.7 or slightly over 0 0.7 um, and there are no distances which are actually higher than, than chance except these, these yellow ones. While if you take the green ones you see distances which are slightly below the threshold of 0 0.3 but there are some, quite a few, which are much below. So for instance you have uh, distances like uh, these ones, okay, which have to do basically with the, the subfamilies of what has sometime, sometimes been uh, referred to as the micro-altaic uh, hypothesis. And then uh, you have uh, Japanese and Korean here. Uh, and then uh, you also have a very interesting average uh, uh, low average distance between two North Caucasian languages and two Dravidian languages here. I will comment on that briefly later. And in the end, uh, um, there is also some kind, uh, some, some kind of uh, suggestive, suggestive uh, evidence that uh, Uralic and Altaic languages have an average syntactic distance, distance which is slightly below uh, the, the threshold. Now, Okay, um, on, the, on the ground of, of this, uh, we can reproduce the general, uh, the, let's say, global tree uh, with the colors suggesting uh, some uh, groups which are at least worth uh, uh, better consideration in terms of uh, long long range comparison. Of course, one group is the Indo-European languages, the red ones. Of course, Indo-European passes the test. And uh, then uh, the, the blue ones are uh, uh, Uralic, Altaic languages and, uh, uh, and Yukagir. And uh, then you have Korean and Japanese here. And then you have uh, the two Dravidian languages and the uh, uh, and the two North Caucasian languages which are clustered together here. Okay, these are clusters which ha are robust enough to pass the, the test provided by the uh, generation of artificial languages. Okay, uh, this sums up the results in the sense, it sums up uh, um, the, uh, let's say, the the groups of languages which seem to pass the test uh, and which are at least worth of more considerations in, uh, in an attempt to, to long range and, and time deep comparison. Uh, okay, um, now I will finish by making some, some remarks uh, about the kind of independent evidence which can or cannot be used in order to support uh, uh, this kind, uh, uh, at least these, these particular groups and these, these, these conclusions. And this is based on the idea that to some extent, in some areas of the world, uh, linguistic variation, linguistic diversity and genetic diversity 
uh, in our case, syntactic diversity and gene in genetic diversity among the populations speaking those languages uh, may correlate to some extent. For instance, in an article that we published in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology a few years ago, uh, we basically tried to show that in Western Europe, uh, Central and Western Europe, uh, uh, syntactic and genetic diversity correlate up to 60%, okay? which is higher in that area than the correlation between genetic diversity and, and uh, geographical, ge geographical distances. This is, this is an interesting point in this area. Okay, then, this means that we can try in some cases, only in some cases, uh, to use, uh, to use uh, genetic uh, differences as a kind of potential correlate uh, to deep uh, syntactic, uh, syntactic variation. Uh, so as for one case, Japanese and Korean uh, studies on modern DNA have revealed that Japanese and, and Korean speakers are genetically very similar. And this is exactly what we find very strikingly from the syntactic viewpoint. And the result goes beyond the much more controversial lexical relationship between the two languages. OK. And um, then another, another consideration is that uh, all languages of East Asia, so Japanese, Korean, Cantonese, Mandarin, um, to some extent Malagasy, which, uh, as we said, uh, ultimately comes from Taiwan, are very different from basically all the rest of Eurasian languages in their syntax. So there is a major divide there. Okay, And this major divide seems to correlate with some archaeological and ancient DNA uh, analysis which have been recently produced, okay? which re re really divides uh, population, uh, populations which are, say, in Siberia, even in eastern Siberia, like uh, um, Tungusic or people, Yakut-speaking speaking people, from the real uh, uh, classical East Asia. And this is exactly something that we find in our syntactic, uh, syntactic classification. Then, most interestingly, uh, we have this kind of similarity between Dravidian and some Caucasian languages. Okay? Now, Dravidian, of course, is, is, is spoken now in India, very marginal in Pakistan, uh, but far away from the Caucasus. Uh, but the interesting thing is that uh, uh, modern Dravidian speakers, uh, from the viewpoint of, the, of, of their DNA, have been uh, shown to be very similar to ancient DNA found in uh, Human, uh, human remains in uh, uh, Western Iran, so immediately south of the Caucasus, basically where modern farming as, as and modern domestication of certain animals uh, began. And this may suggest that uh, the vague idea that uh, uh, Dravidian languages may come from Western Iran and from, from an area close to, to the Caucasus as something to recommend it, and the syntactic, the syntactic uh, uh, results that we have uh, shows that at least this kind of relationship must be considered uh, seriously from the linguistic viewpoint. Okay, there are some details which I, I, I will avoid. I will avoid this too. Uh, okay, um, as for the relationship between Uralic and Altaic, it is impossible to support it through genetic data for reasons that we have already shown in another article, the Santos uh, et al., uh, where we show that uh, already modern Finno Ugric la languages, which are scattered basically through Eastern to Russia and Eastern Europe, um, display uh, no genetic similarity in spite of their linguistic similarity. It's, uh, in, in every case, they seem to share genes with their close neighbors, speakers of various Indo-European or, or Turkic languages, and they do not show a similarity of their own. This is the result probably of early dispersal of small groups of populations. Okay, and uh, okay, finally, 
and this is really final. Final. Uh, my, my final remark is about this notion of deep history that we may try to achieve, and this is a general con consideration. So we 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 all think that uh, well, we, we've been taught that Herodotus, Herodotus was the father of history because he uses the the word in the first line of, of his histories, although, although we don't understand then exactly the meaning of the word. And I, I would, I mean, as, as an expert of, of, uh, uh, of the structure of noun phrases, I will add that we, we don't know exactly how to parse the sentence. But anyway, that's, that's another story. Anyway, he's the father of history in this sense. And, but uh, we also know that uh, a few years later, Thucydides, uh, reacted uh, very, very strongly against uh, Herodotus' methods, I mean, considering them as primitive, as based on hearsay. And he said, uh, well, instead, I'm, I'm a serious historian, because I will tell you the story of particular things uh, that I have seen. Uh, he used, uh, used uh, words which mean relying on evidence, seeing something of which I'm uh, an uh, autoptic uh, uh, witness, okay, and in particular the the Peloponnese the Peloponnese War, and of course he admitted that this kind of method had a failure, namely that he could not uh, he could not uh, investigate more ancient facts because the time distance did not allow him to use his system. The system of uh, witnessing, of uh, listening to witnesses, and so on. Okay. Now, modern historians, uh, Mark Bloch uh, uh, showed that very clearly. Now, uh, do not really, I mean, know that even even uh, uh, listening to direct uh, witnesses is not a reliable way of of, of doing history. I mean, he is proven that that people just change their their tales about. Uh, Past, uh, even recent past events. But anyway, uh, Thucydides opposed his way of doing history to Herodotus' way of doing that. But of course, this was, uh, I mean, at the, I mean, the, this basically involved the explicit loss of deep time history. Well, deep time history, however, is, is very important. And uh, this is exactly what we, what we want to do in order to find explanatory devices in history. And uh, what I'm trying to suggest here is that, is that using modern cognitive science like uh, generative biolinguistics uh, is precisely a way to pursue this objective of deep time history. And uh, in a sense, uh, it uh, converges with an approach that uh, the the Harvard historian Daniel Lord Smail has called deep history based on the study of uh, neurocognitive features uh, of, uh, of human beings. Okay. Uh, and in this sense, I think that the, the, the parametric comparison method is a tool in this direction. And it is a sort of, this is what I call the Clausewitz principle apply, applied to, to, to comparative linguistics. The PCM wants to be the continuation of the historical comparative paradigm by other means. Okay. Thank you very much.